Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and this is my quarantine hair. And welcome to the third lecture in EC3084 signals and systems. In the last lecture, we looked at the idea of a step function, and here we extended the idea of a step function from the discrete time to the continuous time. In the discrete time, the function was zero for values less than zero, and it was one for values that were zero or bigger. To extend this idea to continuous time, we said, okay, we'll have a function that is also zero up until time zero, at which points it jumps up to a one for t bigger than zero, but we're gonna work very hard to try to avoid asking questions about what's happening exactly on the transition. It will be convenient to let this equal one at t equals zero, but this is a subject of controversy, and there are textbooks out there that don't even define this at all. They just leave this as a grand mystery. So this lecture, we'll be looking at the impulse function. The impulse we defined in EC2026 as a function that was one at zero, but was zero every place else. So how might we extend this into continuous time? Now, I'm going to show you the most obvious thing to do and then talk about why it doesn't work. So here I'm going to come up with red, the bad color, which I'm going to use to indicate ideas that seem reasonable at first, but that are going to cause us trouble. So the first thing you might think to do is to say, okay, well, let's just kind of copy this definition over. We'll say that this is one for t equals zero, and we'll say it's zero for t not equal to zero. And to emphasize how little this works, I'm gonna give this a frowny face subscript. The problem with this is that in a calculus context, this doesn't really do anything. Think about, for instance, what would happen if we integrate this function. If I integrate it over its full range of the delta frowny face function dt, well, having this function that's one at one point like this, it has no width to it. So from your usual freshman calculus Riemann integral context, this gives you zero. It has no weight to it. So what we wind up needing to do is to create a more complicated version of the impulse function that is not actually a function at all. So what we need is to define something a little bit unusual. We're going to define a generalized function. So you'll often see this colloquially defined as zero for t not equal to zero. And I'm going to use the bad color again. People will say this is infinity for t equals zero. This is very misleading, and we'll talk a little bit later about why it's a bad idea to describe it like this. The generalized function that we have here is not a regular function in the sense that I can't give you an answer for what this is for every t. It's not a mapping from a domain to a range. These generalized functions are described by the way they react to integrals. So if I have an interval that includes the origin and I integrate this function, I come up with a one. But if I have an interval that doesn't include it, I come up with a zero. So if I were to integrate, say, from minus three to minus two of this delta t dt, here I'll get zero. But if I integrate from minus a half up to a third, then I would get one because the delta function is included in this interval. Now, you may be asking what happens if the interval had an endpoint of zero. We'll come back to that. You have to treat that very carefully. How might we draw such a strange thing on a graph? What we'll do is we'll draw this delta function delta t as being a little line, but we're actually going to put an arrow on it. And you may remember this from DSP first or signal processing first, the earlier chapters. If it's just delta t, we're going to write a little one next to it. This is the weight of the delta function. This doesn't really exist in the same realm as something like maybe drawing a decaying exponential. This is a very weird, strange thing. 
Of course, I can shift these things around. So if I want to have a delta function that lands at point three, I could say that here's zero, one, two, three, and I'll draw it like thus. And maybe I wanted to subtract a delta function that appears over here at maybe minus 1.5. Well, that's fine. Uh, maybe I want this to go downward. Actually, let me use a different color for that because I already put a minus on here, which is kind of blocking things. So maybe this goes downward. Uh, maybe it goes a little bit more, maybe twice. So I could put a minus 2 here. So here, what expression am I drawing? I have a delta at 3, and I'll have a delta at minus 2, so I need to shift it to the left, so I put a plus. But I'll put a minus 2 in front of here, so this is the function that is represented by this particular plot. So this kind of delta function has a very particular name. This is the Dirac delta function, uh, named for the physicist Dirac, who did physics-y stuff. Occasionally, you might hear me accidentally call the discrete time delta function the Dirac delta function, but that's not true. This is not the case. The term Dirac really refers to this continuous time version. Okay, so let's play some math games to get a feel for how you might think about the delta function as being something that's not complete madness. So suppose we'll define a rectangle. What I'm going to do is I'm going to define a rectangle of length delta. So I'm going to subscript my delta. <laughs> oh, I've got two deltas floating around. This is very exciting. So this is a lowercase delta, and this is an uppercase delta. Wow, that was very naughty of me. Okay, so here we've got delta over uh, we've got minus delta over 2 to delta over 2, so the total width of this is delta. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the height of this rectangle 1 over delta. So if I integrate over the entire function here, I come up with 1 regardless of what delta is. So I've got something that integrates to 1. Now, let me apply the hand wavy symbol. Okay, <laughs> it looks like a loaf of bread. Here, this is my toast. I guess um, I'm going to put strawberry jam on my toast. <laughs> okay, so we wave the toast around, and that indicates hand waviness. And <laughs> I'm, I'm using... <laughs> uh, I'm just amusing myself way too much. All right, what we'll do is we'll sort of hand wavily say <laughs> that... <laughs> Okay, calm down, Lanterman. This is not that funny. All right. <laughs> All right. No. Okay. 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 So a hand wavily say that will define our Dirac delta function, I am totally under control, is what we get in the limit as we let this go to zero. So we have these perfectly non-weird rectangles, and we'll say as this width here gets closer to zero, but as the height gets taller and taller to compensate for it so that the total integral of this equals 1, that that's how we can define a delta function. Now, there is a massive amount of mathematics underlying here, that sort of graduate level math goes by the name of measure theory, or you'll hear people also use the term distribution theory, that's really necessary to make this rigorous and meaningful. You can play this kind of derivation with other functions too. You could imagine using something like a Gaussian shape. If you haven't seen a Gaussian shape in other classes, don't worry about it. It's the shape that shows up a lot in probability theory. So you can imagine one of these shapes where it gets narrow and narrow and also taller and taller. And you can play this kind of game with other sort of limiting aspects of shape as long as they get narrow and taller according to some quirky conditions. There are graduate students in math departments who spend a lot of time rowing very hard. They're paddling like daylights underneath the water in order to allow us engineers to leverage these kinds of tools without worrying about the details. Now, there are professors who will teach a junior signals and systems class and go much more into the underlying mathematics. And there are some professors at Georgia Tech who do that. And there are certainly professors in other departments at other schools who do that. I generally personally find that to be a bit overkill for what we need for a junior level class. But I will post some links to some papers about teaching that material in a more rigorous way for the more mathematically inclined viewers who might find that of interest. So suppose I wanted this to integrate, instead of integrate to one, I could integrate to three. What we'll typically do is we'll write that as a Dirac delta function, say it's 
dots here located at zero, and we'll write a little three next to it. So this function would be three delta t. And if we were to integrate this particular function x of t over time, and let's say we're going from minus one to one, we don't need to integrate over infinity. All we need to do is to have the delta function within the limits of the interval that we're integrating over. So this could be equal to three instead of one. One way to think about that is, well, instead of one over delta, maybe this was a three over delta, and you could do the same limiting argument and everything would still make sense. This hits on why this colloquial definition of it being infinity for t equals zero is so incredibly dangerous and leads to some incorrect results. Because then people will try to start reasoning like this. They'll say, oh, well, let's integrate for delta t dt. Well, they'll look at this and they'll say, okay, well, I, I know if I integrate over a delta function, I get one, but let's instead try to think about this on its own. Simplify this before we start integrating things. Well, what will happen in people's heads, and to emphasize this is bad, I will use the bad color for this. This is bad reasoning. They'll say, oh, well, we know that four times zero is zero. Okay, well, there's nothing wrong with that. But then they'll say, okay, well, what's four times infinity? Well, that's just infinity. Similarly, if you took infinity and you added four, you would just get infinity. So then they'll say that this four doesn't matter. They can just fold that into the infinity. And then everyone freaks out because there's a great disturbance in the force because this line of analysis doesn't work. The weight is something that comes out of the integrals. The correct way to think about this is that this delta function here has a four associated with it as the weight. And if I integrate this, I get four out. Remember, these are generalized functions. They don't follow the rules of usual functions. They're only meaningful to the extent that they react when integrated in certain ways. And this puts some limitations on how we use them. For instance, it doesn't make sense to ask, well, what happens if we square a delta function? What happens if we square root of delta function? These don't really have meaningful answers. So any expression you see that has something like this is immediately suspect. The weirdness of a delta function is kind of like strange matter. So if you read about doomsday scenarios about the universe, apparently there's strange matter that will teach other matter how to be strange. And like, so if a bit of strange matter hit the earth, then we would all become strange. I, I don't know. It sounds kind of fun, actually. So to the extent that you want to actually write down some traditional definition for a Dirac delta function, which isn't really a function, it's a generalized function, as if it's pretending to be a function, this line where it is zero for t not equal to zero, that sort of makes sense. But once we're in the realm of what's happening at t equals zero, this is staring into the abyss of some sort of Lovecraftian horror. You don't want to really be looking into here. This is when people start coming up to you and asking if you've read Sutter Kane. So there's just weird, unspeakable weirdness in here. And the weirdness of the delta function affects anything it comes into contact with. Let's say we wrote some innocuous looking function like this. Maybe it's three plus four delta t plus two. How would I sketch that? So maybe I had some graph paper and I did a better job of drawing things or I figured out how to do straight lines in Adobe Sketchbook. Anyway, pretend for the moment that I'm doing this way more professionally than I currently am. I might draw a line here to indicate that this is at height three, since this is height zero, and I might have some tick marks here. Tick, 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 tick. So here's zero, one, two, zero, minus one, two, minus two, minus three. And I need to indicate that there is a delta function of weight four here at minus two. So I'd say, okay, well, let me grab one of my other colors here, and I will draw a vertically going arrow and I'll put a little four next to it. These kinds of graphs are kind of the best way we have to draw it, but they make me nervous because it sort of makes you think that because I've drawn this on a similar scale, or I've tried to at least, here's one, here's two, here's three, here's four, that this four and this three are somehow similar conceptual things, and they're really not. This four 
and this delta function with the four is sort of existing in a different conceptual universe than this three is. And the thing is, this delta function, its weirdness hits everything. This is now not a function anymore. X of t is not a function. Three, x of t equal three on its own would be a function. But the moment I put that delta in here, this whole thing is now a generalized function. It only really makes sense when you integrate it. And writing it as x of t equals blah, blah, blah is really just a convenience. There's a simplification that we'll often make that comes from the observation that the delta function only quote unquote turns on at one particular point. Suppose we have a function x of t, technically this is gonna be a generalized function, that's t cubed times delta t plus two. So t cubed is gonna look a little something like this, and delta t plus two, that's gonna look a little something like this. When we multiply these together, Although what's happening exactly at minus two, as I repeatedly emphasize, is a bit strange, this is gonna get zeroed out every place else, whatever is happening with t cubed. So the only place that t cubed actually matters is at t equals minus two. So I can simplify this function by just taking that minus two, plugging it into t cubed, and then writing delta t plus two. Of course, this is minus eight delta t plus two. So multiplying these things together, I have a delta function that's landed at minus two, and it will have a weight of minus eight. This is a general property. We'll often write this as f of t times delta t minus a, let's say, is going to be equal to f of a times delta t minus a. So wherever this guy turns on, it really only matters at one point. So this gives us an easy way to simplify an expression along these lines. This might seem like a fairly complicated integral, but with this realization that I can make the substitution, This f of a is a constant relative to t, so I can just pull that outside in front. Then I'm left with integrating a delta function over its range. And this evaluates to one, so I'm just left with f of a. This notion here, let me rewrite it, This has a particular name. This often goes by the sifting property. One thing you wanna be careful with is to realize that when you do this initial simplification, you have to have that delta in here first. Sometimes students will get confused because they'll see the version of this formula with the integral and they'll think that they can just willy-nilly drop the delta. The delta only goes away when you do that integration. As an aside, if we go back to 2026 in a discrete time context, we can do the same kind of simplification using the discrete time delta function. So if this was n minus a, we could simplify this by plugging in a for n. Like so. In this lecture, we focused on delta functions. In the previous lecture, we focused on unit step functions. And in the next lecture, we'll show how these relate and how we can do calculus with these things. Basically, the unit step function turns out to be the integral of the delta function, and the delta function turns out to be the derivative of the unit step function in this carefully constructed generalized sense.